everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. I'm going to give folks a minute or two to log in. So um, sit tight. We'll be with you shortly. Hi everyone, I'm going to give it about 30 seconds or so more. I just see the attendee list growing quite rapidly, so I just want to give folks a second to get adjusted. Thanks. All right, I think I'll get things started and hopefully by the time the introductory remarks are over, um, people will be situated. So welcome to today, today's webinar, Equity Made Real, Promising Strategies for Addressing College Student Basic Needs. Um, I first wanna go over a few technical issues regarding GoToWebinar in case folks are unfamiliar with the platform. So Today's PowerPoint can be downloaded from the handout section of your control panel, which you'll see uh, to the right. There should be um, a copy of the PowerPoint and also of our basic needs report that is fresh off the press. Um, second, to submit live questions, you can click, click on the questions panel and type your questions and click send. We'll be doing a QA, and uh, a time permitting at the end, so all questions will be addressed at that time. Um, and lastly, presentation materials and audio will be sent to all registrants and posted on the JBay website under training archive. Also, please note that this is being recorded. You can access this at a later time if you or um, a colleague want to review this um, at a later time. I also want to take a moment to go over today's agenda. So we'll start with an overview of basic needs, the background and evidence supporting various interventions. We'll then go into a legislative history of how we got to where we are today. We'll also do a structure of basic needs centers and review what that looks like on the ground. We'll talk about present challenges to basic needs centers. We'll go over campus practice recommendations. And then we'll hear from the campuses themselves. Um, providing some great examples of how this work is, is done every single day on at two really great campuses, which I'll introduce to you in a second. Um, we'll also go over policy recommendations, and then we'll conclude, as I mentioned, with Q&A. So we are really fortunate to be joined by some really great uh, speakers. The first is Colleen Ganley from the California Community College's Chancellor's Office, the Basic Needs team from Long Beach City College, Justin Mendez and Di Lohi, and the basic needs team from Imperial Valley College, Bianca Bisi and Camila Collado. And I am Melissa Bond. I'm a project manager at John Burton Advocates for Youth. So for those of you who may not be familiar with JBay, we're a nonprofit organization that seeks to improve the quality of life for foster and homeless youth in three main focus areas, health, education, and housing. We engage in legislative advocacy to change laws to create meaningful pathways to higher education and basic needs for these youth. So I wanted to quickly go over kind of the, the methods that went into the present webinar and our basic needs report. So I want to acknowledge that this webinar is debuting JBay's most recent publication, Equity Made Real, Promising Strategies for Addressing College Student Basic Needs. 
A copy of the report is included as an attachment to this webinar and also available at all times on the JBay website. A link is on the slide right there in red. Second, I want to describe the methods and contributions that led to this report's creation. This report was made possible with the support of the ECMC Foundation through its Basic Needs Initiative. We thank the Foundation for both its thought leadership and investment in best basic needs work nationwide. Another crucial ingredient was an extensive literature and legislative review of the history of basic needs work to date and the efficacy of interventions on a national and local level to date. Third, we also engaged in, in 12 interviews that really informed the report and this webinar. And those campuses and stakeholders are listed on the slide. We thank all of them for their generous contributions to this report and to basic needs work at large. The unified themes related to best practices and challenges clearly emerged from these conversations and are presented both in this report and in the webinar. And finally, in the end, all of these ingredients came together in the creation of our basic needs report and are the subjects subject of today's webinar. With that said, I want to take a moment to provide some background information on basic needs. So what are basic needs? Basic needs include any resource deemed necessary for persons or households to achieve and maintain physical well-being, including food, water, and shelter. Maslow famously asserted that these physical survival needs must be met before an individual can engage in higher level tasks such as learning or working. However, the direct application of basic needs as a prerequisite to college success is a relatively novel concept. Traditionally, institutions of higher education have seen themselves largely as academic institutions, not involved in social services. Yet, in recent years, there has been an increasing awareness of basic needs insecurity among college students as homeless and food insecure students have become increasingly visible. The COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated this situation. Now, more than ever, campuses have been forced to realize that when a student's basic needs are not met, students cannot meaningfully pursue higher education. This has resulted in a proliferation of services housed at and staffed by colleges and universities centralized through service hubs known as basic needs centers. So far too often, basic needs are a barrier to higher education. Why, you may ask. In large part because financial aid fails to cover the actual true cost, the full attendance to attend college. Yet at the same time, a higher education degree is associated with long-term economic stability, asset growth, and debt management. Higher education has never been more important as nationwide over the decade prior to the recent economic collapse the economy gained 11 million jobs that require a post-secondary credential while simultaneously losing 5 million jobs that can be secured with a high school diploma or less. So at its core, we are dealing with issues of social and economic justice. So the California community college system has really been ground zero for students challenged by basic needs and security, but also a huge symbol of progress. Why have we chosen to focus on the California Community College System? It's because it's the largest system of higher education in the nation, serving approximately 2.1 million students through 116 campuses. It's also the gateway to higher education for so many historically disadvantaged groups. So research from 2019 from the Hope Center really paints a, a picture of the situation. Out of 40,000 students at 57 community college campuses surveyed, the results indicated that 50% were food insecure in the prior 30 days, 60% were housing insecure in the prior 12 months, and 19% of the respondents were homeless in the previous 12 months. Next, I kind of want to look at evidence supporting interventions and why this is so important and why we are all discussing this today. A handful of studies have looked specifically at programs that focus exclusively on food security. They all point to basic needs security is associated with higher persistence, retention, and financial well-being. More specifically, let's first turn to Massachusetts, an example from Bunker Hill Community College 
that found that students with access to meal vouchers were less likely to experience depression and anxiety, completed more credits, and had a higher persistence rate than a control group. Looking at another intervention in Texas, the basic needs center model known as the Advocacy and Resource Center, or ARC, that was linked with an emergency fund known as the No Excuses Fund at Amarillo College, also noted higher persistence rates with students who received the intervention. And finally, locally here in California, we can look to the Spark Point Basic Needs Model, which is largely regarded as one of the most well-established basic needs programs and located at nine of our community colleges, which demonstrates that financial empowerment-centered services, i.e. one-on-one -on -one financial coaching, tax preparation, wealth accumulation courses, and or credit counseling is associated with a higher rate of persistence, increased monthly income, improved credit score, decreased debt. This model not only affects the individual, but empowers the entire family unit. Next, I'll turn it over to Colleen to discuss the history of basic needs interventions and the legislative history and how we got here today. Wonderful, thank you, Melissa. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Colleen Ganley. I'm a program specialist with the Community College Chancellor's Office. In my role, I work to support basic need activities across the California community college system, including the development of food pantries and CalFresh outreach services. We also just recently launched a pilot program to serve homeless and housing insecure students. And then I also work on two of our statewide foster youth support programs. You know, as Melissa indicated earlier in the presentation, for many years, really since the creation of the community college system, um, we've operated with the main goal and the focus of providing education to students. It's only been in more recent years that the Chancellor's Office and the state legislature have recognized more deeply that if students are chronically hungry or if students are sleeping in their cars at night, they will likely not be very successful in college. And I say this with one caveat, I say this with a recognition that community college faculty and staff have known for years about how basic need issues impact their students. Locally, colleges have worked with very limited resources to address the basic needs of their students. So kudos um, to you guys. Uh, today, I'm gonna start with a really brief overview of legislative changes that have supported the evolution of basic need services in our system. In 2013, Assembly Bill 1930 passed, which expanded eligibility for students to participate in the federally sponsored Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP, historically known as food stamps. In California, the SNAP program is called CalFresh. In 2016, in partnership with the California Department of Social Services, the Foundation for California Community Colleges launched a new initiative called the Fresh Success Program. This program allows participating colleges and community-based organizations to provide enhanced student services, and in some cases, provide direct aid to students who are also simultaneously receiving CalFresh benefits. In 1718, we had a huge legislative win for colleges and for students as there was funding included in the state budget for food security services to all students. All three public higher education segments received this funding um, in sponsor of the Hunger Free Campus Initiative. Uh, over the last several years, multiple bills have passed which have enabled the California Department of Social Services to work with both the CSU and the California Community College System offices to expand a unique program called the Restaurant Meals Program. Uh, similar to the Hunger Free Campus funding, the 2019-2020 state budget included funds for all three public higher education segments to start a new program to support homeless and housing insecure students. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to provide a little bit more detail on each one of those items, but I'm, I'm going to go through those items in a slightly different order. Uh, next, slides. next slide, please. So the first thing I wanna dive into is the Hunger Free Campus Initiative. And this effort has been foundational to basic needs services across our system. In 1718, the community college system received 2.5 million. In 1819, we received 10 million. And in 1920, we received 3.9 million for food security services for our students. These funds were distributed to the then 
114 California community colleges and they were distributed based on the total number of students at each college. You know, the original purpose for the Hunger Free Campus funds included creating or expanding food pantries or food distribution on campus and to provide support to students to get enrolled in CalFresh benefits. Over the last three years, we have collected Hunger Free Campus data from the colleges. During our first data collection effort, we had 95% of the colleges reported um, offering food pantry or food distribution services on campus. And the majority were also providing support for their students to get enrolled in CalFresh benefits. And it's pretty unique that money would come in the budget and that colleges would be so quick to ramp up these kind of services. Over the last three years, we've collected uh, a number of different data points. We've seen an exponential growth in colleges partnering with their local food banks to access low and no cost foods. We have 12 of the community colleges that are partnering with Chico State uh, University on a CalFresh outreach program. And many of the colleges are actively working with the Department of Social Services to enable their students to use CalFresh benefits on campus. Uh, for some current context during the, during the pandemic, some of the colleges are offering drive-through pantry services. They are providing their students with electric, electronic grocery gift cards, and some are even delivering care packages to their most in-need students. The efforts that are currently happening in the face of this crisis are way above and beyond. Next slide, please. We have seen a tremendous growth in the variety of service of basic need services that colleges are providing to students. At this time, at the time of our first data collection effort, almost 50% of the colleges were creating clothing closets and developing comprehensive basic needs centers. Uh, at the time, many of the colleges were providing financial literacy workshops to students and developing meal donation programs. Uh, the one thing I, I want to say is that the California Community College Hunger Free Campus Champions, and you guys know who you are, um, they are doing a lot of work and they are very, very resourceful with pretty limited funding. And so they're very creative, they really leverage partnerships, um, and it's, it's just an accolade to them. Unfortunately, the 2021 state budget did not include Hunger Free Campus funds, though the colleges, the California Community Colleges, are being allowed to carry over their hunger-free campus funds um, from 1920 into the 2021 20, fiscal year. And, and obviously we're hoping um, that we see those funds again for these really critical services. Next slide, please. On this next slide, we have some of our data. As of spring 2018, colleges had served over 100,000 unique students with food pantry services. I believe this to be a very, very conservative number. This is the first time that the California Community Colleges were reporting this type of data. So I think that's a very conservative number. Uh, colleges had provided support to over 15,000 students to complete the CalFresh application. And at the time, we had over 1,500 faculty and staff that were trained and were providing support to students to get enrolled in CalFresh. Um, a side note, we're currently getting ready to administer another hunger-free campus data collection effort. So for all of the California Community College folks on the call today, please know this request will be coming to your inbox soon. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the passage of Assembly Bill 1930 made a significant change to CalFresh eligibility for college students. Previous to the passage of 1930, if a student was taking six or more units, they would have to meet one of a few exemptions in order to even be eligible to apply for CalFresh. These exemptions include having a dependent under the age of 12, being a CalWORKs recipient, having a confirmed health condition that prohibits employment, or working 20 hours per week. And this is the exemption that most students opted to use. So it really became known as the 20 hour work week uh, rule for students. Uh, 1930 required the Department of Social Services to work with stakeholders to establish a list of higher education programs that would create a new type of exemption for college students. These exempting programs needed to increase employability for students. In February of 2017, 
the Department of Social Services released all county letter 17-5, which provides a list of approved exempting programs. So students participating in various categorical programs, those approved for work study, or those participating in support programs designated for foster youth, including extended foster care, they can now qualify for an exemption and they are eligible to apply for CalFresh benefits. This is a really significant change and it really widens uh, the number of students who are eligible to apply for CalFresh. They still have to go through the CalFresh application process. They still have to meet CalFresh eligibility um, criteria, but this allows them to actually apply. I, I would say as a follow-up item to this, we will provide you all information about the process to have your program considered to become an exempting program. So if you are hosting a program that you think increases employability, we can give you some information about how you might be considered um, by the Department of Social Services to become an exempting program. Uh, the Department of Social Services was also required to convene a student data work group to assess how many students were currently receiving CalFresh benefits and how many were likely eligible but not receiving benefits. Uh, according to their research, they estimate that approximately 127,360 students were currently receiving CalFresh benefits and that there are likely between 400 to almost 700,000 eligible students who are likely eligible but who are not receiving benefits. Next slide, please. As part of our efforts to assist colleges to promote the availability of CalFresh benefits, we developed and distributed a CalFresh outreach toolkit to all the then 114 community colleges. These toolkits included stand-up posters and postcards and all sorts of collateral material that colleges could use on campus to let students know about CalFresh and to encourage them, encourage the students to apply for benefits. Next slide, please. When the pandemic hit um, and colleges transitioned to online instruction, we converted the CalFresh toolkits into a digital format. All of the digi digital materials are print ready and can be downloaded from the Foundation for California Community Colleges website. I would also like to mention a really wonderful student-facing CalFresh website that was developed by Code for America in partnership with the Department of Social Services. It is students.getcalfresh.org and we'll provide that. It's, it's all over the um, digital toolkit. Um, it's all over the uh, hard copy toolkit and we'll make sure that all of you get that link. It's a wonderful website where students can um, apply for CalFresh benefits in probably what is the most painless possible process. So I encourage you to encourage your students to visit that website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, CalFresh benefits generally cannot be used to buy prepared or hot foods, such as those sold in many campus cafeterias. However, there is a program called the Restaurant Meals Program that allows people who are homeless disabled or elderly to use their CalFresh benefits to purchase prepared meals, including hot meals from approved restaurants. As of 2018, only 10 counties were participating in the restaurant meal program, though through various legislation, including Assembly Bill 612 and Assembly Bill 1747, um, a requirement of the Department of Social Services to work with both the CSU system office and the community college chancellor's office to develop statewide memorandums of understanding that would allow all CSU and all California community college campuses to participate in the restaurant meals program. As it stands now, the Department of Social Services is doing analysis regarding the development and implementation of these MOUs. So more to come on that topic. Uh, next slide, please. In another significant attempt to address student basic needs, the Foundation for California Community Colleges, in partnership with the Department of Social Services and multiple philanthropic partners, launched a new program called the Fresh Success. The Fresh Success program is an intervention that allows colleges and community-based organizations to access federally sponsored CalFresh employment and training funds. This is, um, one subset of the larger uh, CalFresh funding that is available across the country. 
By leveraging federal matching funds, the Fresh Success Program enables participating colleges and community-based organization to provide enhanced support services, and in some cases, direct aid to student. Uh, this particular project is very near and dear to my heart. It's designed to provide support for students already receiving CalFresh benefits and to students who apply for and are deemed eligible for CalFresh benefits. Leveraging these federal funds helps colleges and their partners fill gaps for services and expand support to low income participants. Next slide, please. In July of 2019, the state legislature allocated new funding, the first of its kind, to address homelessness among college students. The state allocated 19 million annually to the state's three public post-secondary institutions. The UC system received 3.5 million, the CSU received 6.5 million, and the California Community College system received 9 million. The funding must be used to support rapid rehousing efforts that assist homeless and housing insecure college students. Per statute, all the campuses must establish partnerships with community-based housing providers to provide wraparound services and rental subsidies for eligible students. Funding may also be used to connect students with community case managers, establish ongoing emergency housing procedures, and to provide emergency grants to secure housing or prevent students from becoming homeless. In the California Community College System, we are working with 14 colleges to implement the program. We call it the Homeless and Housing Insecurity Pilot Program with the acronym of HIP, um, which I like. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the program, the goals, I'm sorry, the goals of the HIP program are to reduce homelessness and housing insecurity for California community college students and to support their attainment of permanent housing and to support those at risk of becoming homeless, um, helping to keep them in their current housing. The logic follows that if a student has a permanent home, they will do better. They will likely stay in college and complete their education. Because this is a pilot program, our office will be doing a more formal evaluation of the effort with the goal of really establishing a proof of concept, some efficacy of these efforts. We would really like to show the legislature that this is a very sound investment, that these students can be successful, and ideally an investment that can be expanded to additional colleges in the future. Next, I'm going to turn it back to Melissa to go over the structure of basic need centers. Thank you so much, Colleen. So yes, I'm going to go over now um, structure of basic need centers as um, we discovered through a lot of our conversations with campuses. So based on this review of just the subset of campuses that I mentioned prior, um, there are elements that are consistent across the campuses as well as elements that differ. Most campuses start with a food pantry. This is the foundation of basic needs offerings. Depending on the student population, demand, and the college's capacity, campuses can add to their offerings. Here's a visual depicting the various offerings of basic needs centers sprouting from the food pantry foundation. As I'll discuss, not all campuses have all of these offerings, but this just shows the variety and potential of the various sprouting off offshoots from the food pantry. So now on to similarities and differences. The first uh, big one is location. Basic needs centers can vary in, ter vary in terms of the department in which they are housed. Where the original champions found campus allies is where the basic needs centers likely found its departmental home. If the basic needs center has a focus on financial empowerment, for instance, it is no surprise that it would be located within the financial aid office, for example. Offerings is another point of similarity and difference. As stated, basic needs work commonly begins with the food pantry, and food pantries are a logical starting point, but depending on the student population, campus capacity, and supplementary services, this can look very different as the previous um, graphic depicted. And also funding is another point of similarity and difference. 
Uh, some basic needs centers are completely funded by a single source, while others operate under a funding hybrid from a variety of sources. As will be discussed further, a diversified funding structure allows basic needs centers to weather changing budget priorities, especially during crises like COVID-19. So now on to the top challenges. So of the campuses um, that we interviewed, COVID-19 first and foremost was one of the top challenges mentioned. With campuses closing in response to the pandemic, basic news centers have had to find ways to serve students remotely and with fewer staff. Many food pantries modified services to allow drive-through pickup of delivery of groceries, in-person consultations were converted to Zoom, and word of mouth or classroom marketing of services transitioned largely to social media or text message. Associated challenges include how to reach the most value, uh, vulnerable students who lack the technological capacity to be tapped in, how to forge the same level of trust and connection with students when interactions are no longer in person, how to effectively market services with the loss of physical space and visibility, and how to manage the loss of work-study students who are not allowed to be on campus during closures. In addition, how do they meet the increased demand for services with limited supply and staffing? COVID-19 has thrown a wrench in many of the basic needs centers operations and plans, but as I'll discuss, they have been so resilient. Another challenge is limited funding for basic needs centers. As noted earlier, Hungry for Campus money was not renewed, renewed in the 2020-2021 budget, leaving basic needs centers to look for alternative funding to continue and expand services. Another challenge, lack of resources and the expertise to address college student homelessness. Institutions of higher education are only now beginning to develop their expertise on homelessness and homelessness support programs are evolving to serve college students at the same time. Thus, the best practices related to serving homeless and housing insecure college students is now just an emerging practice. Another challenge, reaching the most vulnerable students as with all social services in general, effectively targeting services to those with the greatest level of need is a long-standing challenge. These students include undocumented students, veterans, parenting students, those who may have stopped out, and those who have already graduated. And lastly, another challenge uh, shared with us was concern about mission creep, both inside and outside of the college. Many campuses express frustration that the cultural shift towards embracing basic needs practices is occurring too slowly. They note that naysayers, those who question whether it is the place of higher education to be involved with addressing basic needs, both within and outside of campuses, are a hindrance to change, and that the only remedy is sustained and continuous <laughs> education. So next, I wanna, this brings us logically to kind of our best practice recommendations to campuses, which emerged from our interviews with basic needs center staff at 10 campuses highly regarded in the field for their basic needs work. So number one, promote collaboration between students and leadership in the design of programming. Regardless of whether the impetus for the creation of a center came from students or leadership, Joining forces to champion basic needs work on campus led to greater success. Interviewees noted that the partnership between students and campus staff took various forms. For example, administrators worked with students to donate unused dining hall meal credits to fellow students. Students donated student lounge space, or faculty gave up underutilized offices to create food pantries. And campuses united around food drives or professional clothing drives to enable students to have appropriate job interview attire. These are examples of both sides coming together towards a, a common goal. Partnering with students to develop basic needs centers in ways that were student friendly was also essential to ensure engagement by both students and faculty and administrators. Number two create a basic needs tax for us. Successful colleges has, have often, often have a basic needs team or a task form 
a task force rather, pardon me, uh, with representatives from key departments, including financial aid, admissions, student affairs, health services, housing, dining, et cetera, as well as members from the student body, faculty, and leadership. Such a team encourages participation from all perspectives, creating brainstorming, open communication, and collective ownership of basic needs problems and solutions. In addition, this shared responsibility alleviates a portion of the burden too often carried solely by basic needs staff. The task force should collectively write and execute a strategic plan with clearly defined goals and metrics for success. Number three, engage with students during the application and matriculation processes. Basic needs centers can partner with admissions offices to ensure that high school students understand the resources that are available and are not dissuaded from applying because of concerns about basic needs. This is applicable now more than ever. Basic needs services, along with the availability of financial aid, should be highlighted in all admissions marketing materials and should be presented clearly and boldly on the college's website. Furthermore, basic needs staff should be included during admission student days or new student orientations to make presentations and make clear what is available for incoming students. It needs to be very clear to prospective students that basic needs is a priority on the campus. Number four, dedicate a physical space for the basic needs center and at the same time develop a strong remote presence. Far too often, basic needs centers begin in a spare closet on campus, and the limited amount of space allocated for basic needs centers does not adequately serve students. Instead, basic needs centers need to be designed from a student-centered perspective and occupy a prominent and accessible space on campus, such as the student lounge. Such a community space allows for maximum engagement of the community and continued discussions that push for continuous improvement. At the same time, learning from COVID-19, basic needs centers also need to have remote capacity and a strong presence outside of the physical space, such that students continue to know that they are supported even from afar. Number five, leverage food pantries. As noted, food pantries are not, not only address hunger, they provide an opportunity to engage with students in conversation or collect data that may reveal more complex needs. At a minimum, centers can leverage food pantries as a tool for students to become aware of available support and know where to go to obtain further help. More ideally, they can serve as a tool for data collection and as a referral hub. By requiring either the completion of a simple intake form or swiping of a student identification card, Information can be cross-referenced to demographic and academic information to better, better understand the student population, accessing the resources, and where there are gaps. Supplementing quantitative, quantitative data with conversations can really provide a holistic picture. Number six, mitigate stigma by offering a safe and open space to the entire community. Effective basic needs centers embody stigma-reducing practices. An emerging trend is to welcome everybody, students, faculty, and staff alike. Proof of status as a student or evidence of income level should never be required to use services, and uniform rules should apply to all. For example, one bag of groceries per person per day. The space should be centrally located, open and visible in all parts of the campus, just, such as the student union or the wellness center. It should look like a lounge, a fun hangout place that allows the convergence of students, faculty, staff, and the community at large, a place for relaxed conversation. Centers also need to use stigma reducing language and marketing, using value free names for centers and avoiding language related to quote unquote needy or quote unquote less fortunate students. After all, everybody has basic needs. Seven, utilize stigma reducing and broad reaching outreach strategies. Related to outreach, the best basic needs centers target the entire community and seize every opportunity to market their resources and services and to educate the community. They make presentations, 
often with free snacks during classes, club meetings, faculty meetings, orientations, and events. They provide free snacks and education throughout the campus or during pop-up events or school events. We also engage faculty in this work, helping them to provide statements on syllabi for contact information for the basic needs centers. As a great example of inclusive stigma-free marketing, check out these two flyers from the Cal 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 pardon me, CalFresh outreach tool that Colleen mentioned. As you can see, they're very, very inclusive and applicable to everybody in the community. Number eight, embrace a peer-to-peer -peer model by involving student workers. To encourage a culture of trust and communication, effective basic needs centers embrace student workers in all aspects of operations. Many student workers are eligible for federal work study and often have lived experience with basic needs and security. These are credible messengers who often can provide empathy and understanding of the complexities of navigating college student life and can provide culturally competent services in a variety of languages. It is no surprise that many students feel more comfortable speaking with a peer about sensitive issues than they do with a staff. Number nine. Integrate seamlessly with other campus departments and develop a holistic approach to financial aid determination. So basic needs centers do not serve students in isolation. To provide holistic care, they leverage, they leverage the resources and expertise of other college departments to share information and provide students with wraparound care. Notable campus allies are financial aid, admissions and records, health services, dining services, and programs serving the most vulnerable students, such as EOPS and foster youth support programs. Particularly crucial is a strong relationship with the financial aid office, which allows the basic needs centers to communicate special circumstances facing a student that may alter their financial aid eligibility, such as homelessness status. Financial aid offices have significant flexibility to adjust financial aid packages to address extenuating circumstances or changes to a student's status. So specific strategies that I wanna emphasize are, you know, ensuring FAFSA completion, streamlining the homeless verification process, maximizing aid through appropriate EFC and COA adjustments, fully implementing AB 2416. And this is a new one, um, which would require colleges to consider homelessness as an extenuating circumstance for SAP appeals. All of these strategies and much more can be further utilized to integrate with the financial aid office to truly support students and make sure that students are supported um, in all ways, including financial. Number 10. Collaborate with outside partners. Just as basic needs centers need internal college partners, they also need outside community partners from all sectors to best serve students. First, basic needs centers need trusted outside partners to refer students to for services most colleges cannot provide alone, such as legal services, domestic violence counseling, or substance use disorder treatment. Second, Basic need centers also rely upon external strategic partnerships of mutual value. For instance, colleges have collaborated with food banks, donating the college's physical space to hold community food drives in exchange for in-kind donations of food. These win-win arrangements utilize multi-sector partnerships that, that encourage creative problem solving and leverage existing resources to better serve students. And lastly, number 11. Invest in robust data collection and analysis. The most stable and effective basic needs centers collect and analyze both quantitative and qualitative data for a variety of reasons. Just a few off the top of my head is to justify the intervention to support its continued existence and its expansion for program design and modification, to gauge effectiveness, to better know those who we are serving to observe and address service gaps, and of course, for funding and storytelling. Unfortunately, given the myriad resources 
and capacity restraints of most basic needs centers, data collection and analysis remains an area of improvement, but definitely a necessary area of investment. So enough from me, let's hear from the campuses themselves. First, we'll hear from Imperial Valley College and second from Long Beach City College. Both campuses serve students effectively and creatively, and they will be providing us with both an overview of their services and highlight some of the best practices and lessons learned that they have collected over the years. So Imperial Valley, please take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Camila Collado, and I am an academic advisor for the Student Equity and Achievement Program at Imperial Valley College. And today I join you on the line with our interim associate dean, Bianca BC, and we are honored to be here today to share a little bit about what our best practices and basic needs initiatives look like at Imperial Valley College. Uh, first, I would like to start off with providing you with a little background and some information about our community, our program and our services, and what it looked like pre-pandemic. Highlighting what our services looked like before, how they were impacted, and how we have created a pandemic response to continue to meet the needs of our students under the most challenging circumstances. Our campus is located in a desert valley. We are a rural town bordering Mexico. I want to point out where I say that we are a desert valley. Um, we face some of the most extreme weathers here. Our summers are long and hot, reaching temperatures up to 120 degrees and our winters are cold and dry, reaching as low as 34 degrees. I feel it is important for me to mention this so you can have some insight as to how our campus and the barriers our students face can be additionally impacted due to our harsh weathers. Our campus is located miles away from any of our neighboring cities and it isn't easily accessible without reliable transportation and the bus routes in our county don't even have a permanent schedule route year round to our campus. So right off the bat, our students are already challenged with barriers related to transportation. We have seen students riding bikes, um, walking to campus um, just to make it to class or even during um, our distributions trying to pick up their food in bags and find a way to take that home to, or wherever they are residing. And by mentioning what our weathers look like, keep that in mind while you see them walking on their way to campus um, in those extreme weathers, it, it's terrible. Um, our basic needs initiative was formed in 2016 and we began recognizing and addressing poverty, food and housing insecurities that were faced by our disproportionately impacted college students. Soon after, our team and initiatives quickly began to grow, which then led to and resulted in us implementing more basic needs services and opening our first ever campus food pantry in 2017. It is what we call, and it is also known as our IVC kitchen. In our basic needs initiative, we really wanted to put a focus on implementing what we felt were the greatest and most important needs. Listing them, they include implementing a holistic case management approach, emergency food, housing, technology, textbooks, emergency funding, and transportation. To really encompass student success, we work to identify the greatest needs and barriers our most disproportionately impacted students were facing, and we developed a plan that would address their needs and eliminate those barriers that in many situations would negatively negatively impact their student success or very well be the deciding factor whether they could continue their education with us or drop courses. When we were on campus, we truly had a system that provided students with a safe environment to reach out for help, have those one-on-one -on -one meetings with their students where trusting relationships and rapport was built and where we work closely and continuously with our students to truly implement our holistic case management approach and provide those core wraparound services. Clearly a lot has happened from when we were last on campus and how we implemented our best practices have also truly been changed and impacted. So next, Bianca will begin to explain how we had to revamp and transform how we connect with our students and how we have worked to meet their basic needs amid this pandemic. Um, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Bianca 
I am the Associate Dean of Student Activity and Achievement at Imperial Valley College. And um, Camila did an amazing job of letting you know historically what we've done to provide basic needs um, to our students. So taking a look at um, our holistic case engagement during a pandemic, um, we have to really ask ourselves, how do we assess digitally and how do we remain socially uh, relevant? as well as without front counters, without a physical front desk, how do we serve the line of students that are lining up outside of our office, our virtual office, if we're no longer on campus, and in what ways do we prioritize students? So I really wanted to um, piggyback off of what Camila shared in terms of our background and give you your campuses some helpful tips to stay, to stay digitally and socially relevant um, in this new uh, virtual setting for a community college. So if you could see on the left-hand side, first and foremost, make sure that you have a digital opportunity for students to reach out to. I'm sure most of us on this call have already um, successfully transitioned to a virtual counter or virtual services. So make sure that um, you have an easily accessible button for students to click on to request for support. The barcode looking JPEG that's in the middle of this PowerPoint is called a QR code. Um, many of our students are familiar with these. Students are able to use their camera phones, which many of our students use their cell phones to um, complete their homework. So many of them are tech savvy and are able to uh, use these QR codes. And you'll also see the link for Bitly that I'll go into a little bit of detail. And my hope is that you'll walk away with some tips to take back to your campus. Next slide. So first off, uh, and I promise um, this isn't a paid advertisement, Bitly is an amazing um, app that we use online. It's free. Uh, you create an account and it helps you to remain socially relevant and visually pleasing. Have you ever tried to create a flyer and you're trying to send a link for your webpage, for us, for example, www.imperial.edu slash student equity and achievement, trying to squeeze that onto a flyer isn't visually pleasing. So Bitly allows you to shorten URLs in a way that look clear, concise, hip, and socially relevant for students. So you'll, you'll see that there's a graph here Bitly not only shortens your URLs to make them kind of more modern and socially relevant, it also gives you the opportunity to have a click track record for how many individuals have clicked on your link um, and in what ways did they open it. Did they open it through a text message, through an email, through their cell phone, and also locations, which is really helpful when you want to make decisions about specific um, support for zip codes and areas um, local to your campus. Next slide. Additionally, QR codes, that was the weird looking little barcode that was at the initial slide. You'll see QR codes are really accessible and really socially relevant to our students because they can use their cell phone uh, camera and go ahead and focus it on one of those barcodes and it'll take you directly to something like if you created a survey monkey or you created a, an important content request form button on your student support services webpage, it'll take the student directly there if they use their phone to scan that instead of going in and typing and maybe um, spelling a URL. It's free and it also shortens just the way Bitly does. And so I'm really hoping that these tips would assist your campus. Next slide, please. And most importantly, when we talked about what are we doing now that we don't have physical front desks and counters to serve the lines, in what way do you prioritize? We, we've we always had that issue where we have tried to figure out who's the target population, um, in what way are we going to digitally support our students? So. For us, what we ended up doing is creating a contact request form. And our contact request form um, was a digital needs assessment that's trauma-informed. It just replicates what we do in person. So for us, we're able to create a digital form. And that digital form will allow students to check all that apply in terms of whether or not they need help applying to our campus, 
all the way from if they're experiencing homelessness, um, eviction, or need food assistance. So make sure that you have a strategy for your champions on campus who are able to assess students and are able to connect them to those needs. So for us, we created this content form. And um, next slide, please. And we'll go ahead and hand this over to back to Camila, who's going to give you more information on how our basic needs distribution was adjusted to meet the pandemic response. Camila, you may be on mute, just double check. Oh, thank you. I said I was muted by the organizer and I was having trouble to unmute it. Um, so to continue, um, so adapting was something we were no stranger to. And our basic needs initiative team has worked hard over the past four years to provide preventative and sustainable solutions to our campus with little to no resources from our outside communities. Um, hard work and creative innovative solutions is something we pride ourselves in, but nonetheless is still very challenging when facing the many barriers and lack of resources our rural border town communities faced with. The type of basic needs services we provided all remain the same, but how we provided and how we gave our students access to obtain their basic needs is what we had to change. Like Bianca mentioned, we really had to get tech savvy and began utilizing many online form requests that were easy, quick, and accessible to the students through various forms of technology. This made outreach and contact with our students much more accessible and consistent. As a campus and as a community, we all came together. We began to see our basic needs team grow and expand with the help and assistance from staff and faculty members from various programs and departments on campus. Collectively utilizing all of our different resources on campus, we created a once a month mass drive-through contact list system. We set in place some safety regulations. All staff and faculty are health screened upon arrival to campus and we ensure staff is provided with plenty of PPE. Students are also asked to remain in their cars and wear a mask when they come on campus. Um, our food, technology, hygiene supplies, textbooks, and gift cards are all provided to students utilizing the drive-through method. For students that do not have access to transportation, they can request to have their food and supplies home delivered. We have a team of staff volunteers that arrange for home contactless deliveries and ensure that students without transportation receive the same fair access to their services. Any other supplies like textbooks or emergency gift cards, funding for housing and utilities can be issued through to our students through shipping methods, or if that's not an option, we can include it in our home delivery system. And all of our other services that require connection with our students to establish trust and rapport, including our assessment for services, case management, housing referrals, and student support are all made available via phone, email, and through Zoom meetings. The online form request system has truly helped maintain that connection that we need with our students. Next slide, please. So if you weren't aware, we were all over the news as a red hotspot for COVID-19 infection rates. We had four times the national average in increasing infection rates. And due to the alarming rate of infections in our county, FEMA came in, set up a federal, med a federal medical station on our campus, converting our gym into a hospital for COVID-19 patients. As a result, our methods of how we planned and conducted services to students became more challenging and it also increased many concerns and stressors for our students and our staff. Many of our students who requested home deliveries had tested positive for COVID, making it a health concern for our staff that often led to additional safety concerns and increasing anxieties. Although we have made some great strides to overcome the challenges this pandemic has thrown our way, there is still so much we can do and improve to meet the needs of our students. 
our teams meet on a weekly basis to connect, brainstorm, to create, and to implement new ideas that may enhance and better serve our students. Currently, we are now serving 150 student households a month, averaging roughly about 450 plus individuals. More laptops have been secured and we are doing our best to, to ensure that any student in need of technology has access to internet and a laptop. Our transportation system still needs some work, but in the meantime, we are using our delivery system to ensure our students' food and supplies are received. And lastly, our housing project is finally taking its first steps into making our housing program a reality for our students. Next slide, please. Um, thank you, Camila, for going in and uh, summarizing those details. Um, I am extremely proud of our college for how we handled, um, you know, left and right things happening. Uh, it seemed like we haven't been able to catch a break, but large, amazing, positive outcomes have come throughout this time. Primarily, I'm most proud of um, our student, Benito Gomez, whose picture here on the PowerPoint slide, and um, myself being interviewed by Governor Newsom after announcing that our campus, um, we wrote a grant for $3 million for Project Home Keep funding. After four years of trying, uh, we finally solidified and secured our funding for our tiny home living community, uh, Lotus Living Rise Above. So I'm very proud that this was one of the best forms of positive news we could have received during the pandemic. And I will be giving you some tips on how to um, create buy-in in your area if your campus is interested in forming tiny homes or student housing. Next slide, please. Um, here we are on a, a, camp, a site visit at the amazing Hope Village in Medford, Oregon. So again, we're in the most southern part of uh, Southern California and Imperial Valley. We flew all the way out to Oregon to take a look at different uh, student, student housing sites. So uh, for Project Home Key, in the future, as soon as January, we'll be able to provide 13 units of, of tiny homes on a local lot of land. They're already uh, prepping the land and leveling. And our own student who was mentioned earlier being recognized by Governor Newsom um, will become our residential assistant for the student housing. All um, residents will be provided with a savings account as well as wraparound case management that will provide supportive services, academic services, and uh, financial literacy courses. Next slide, please. Um, our more short-term and immediate response, because you know, IBC likes to, to offer immediate, short-term, and long-term solutions um, to any type of barrier. Our more short-term and immediate response is our student housing project um, made possible by Imperial County and the state. We were given 12 um, RV homes and they were placed in a local mobile home park. Um, they're being led by our current resident uh, assistant that I mentioned earlier. There are, those students are also able to develop a savings account and be provided the same wraparound case management services. So some tips on um, what I would like your campuses to take back if you are interested in developing um, this type of student housing uh, on your campus are most importantly buy-in. Uh, we all know and hear in the news whenever an affordable housing project or homeless services uh, come into specific towns, they get run out of town sometimes and they're seen as, you know, um, like encampments are seen as an eyesore and, and they're just having like a negative type of approach to it. So buy-in is important. That's why we went in throughout California and even in Oregon and visited other sites and we didn't need to ask about a residential breakdown of a program. That part's easy. We know we need to house and provide wraparound case you know, management. It was how do we get the city, the police department, the neighbors on our side to make sure that our students are in a safe environment uh, with dignity. So back at your campus, um, be heavily involved in your local continuum of care. Most likely the team who handles your HUD funding and conducts your point, of time, uh, point in time count for your homeless population. Reach out to your local city officials and even police departments to create a think tank or a task force on how to make this possible. 
Now, going back to what I initially said about making sure that you recognize who out in the community doesn't have your buy-in, position yourself as someone who will alleviate, and you can't see my hands doing finger quotes, alleviate a problem for cities, uh, for police, for mental health and hospitals locally. The problem that they experience is that they don't have enough budget, they don't have enough time, they don't have enough resources, or sometimes there's that you know, stigma or even discrimination. So you be willing to be that expert and to position yourself as someone who will alleviate this so-called problem. Uh, visit other successful sites to translate their program into your city. And um, I want to personally thank um, Camila, um, our basic needs team at Imperial Valley College, Governor Newsom, the Imperial County and City of El Central for making sure that after four hard years, um, we're now going to be able to impact that um, our homeless population and provide students this resource. So on to our next slide, please. I would like to introduce our amazing friends and colleagues who are leading the Basic Needs Initiative at Long Beach City College. Greetings, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to be here and would uh, like to thank JBay and the Chancellor's Office for their work and support in expanding uh, support for basic needs throughout our state. Uh, I want to thank LBCC for hiring me. I want to thank my mom. I want to thank, no, I'm just kidding, everybody. Just kidding. Just want to make sure y'all are still with us. Um, so allow me to introduce myself. My name is Justin Mendez, and I am the Basic Needs Program Manager at LBCC. Good afternoon, everyone, and my name is Dianca Lohe. I am an MSW, and I am the Basic Needs Coordinator here at Long Beach City College. And we're going to be following our colleagues lead from IVC. We are going to share some of the basic needs services that we're currently providing at LBCC and some best practices that we've learned from uh, throughout our experience with students. Next slide. Hi, everyone. So a large part of what I do is provide one-on-one -on -one support to our most vulnerable students, those who are experiencing food and housing insecurity. I connect students with both on and off campus resources based on their unique needs and situations using a holistic trauma-informed approach. The Viking Vault Services. The Viking Vault is Long Beach City College's food pantry and we provide a wide range of amenities. Using free, give, free food giveaways to raise awareness is key in reaching college students. And although this has proven to be challenging during COVID-19, we are rocking it. We hold bi-weekly grab and go food distributions that provide essential foods to our students and their families. Included in the grocery bags are recipes, CalFresh flyers, flyers for events, for such as, events such as our virtual Latinx Heritage Month and Domestic Violence Awareness Prevention Series, most recently. We provide in-person grocery pickup by appointments on a weekly basis. We also host live Zoom cooking demonstrations using culturally relevant recipes and ingredients included in our grocery bags. We also provide grocery gift cards to students based on their level of need determined by the Long Beach City College Student Emergency Aid application. And just to talk about some of the pictures that you're looking at. So on the, the left picture on the top, that's our Viking Vault. And that's what the students are seeing as they're arriving to pick up their groceries based off appointment. We keep the table outside, making sure they're never coming in and we're still enforcing social distance requirements. On the right is the recipe that we would include in their bags. The recipes are based off the items that they're actually receiving in the bags. And that's the recipe that they um, demonstrate in our cooking shows. Um, and then that's what you're seeing at the bottom. That is a, a picture of our live cooking show. And we wanted to get that back shot to show that, you know, we didn't do this with professional equipment. It was really put in a laptop on top of a couple of boxes to make sure we got the angle right. Um, and using a couple of our actual own staff's own cooking items to demonstrate it. And what they did was for Latinx Heritage Month, they had a, like a three part series. So the first one, it was a corn and black bean salsa dip. The second was the main entree. They showed us how to make some black bean and grilled veggie tacos. And then they finished with um, arroz con leche. And they were, we were doing that live. And we, as they were cooking it, we were sharing some poetry and spoken word from Latinx authors. And we also had 
the chance to bring in a special guest, you know, the, the little one on the right, that's actually my daughter who, you know, definitely loved the opportunity and, and kind of made the show a little bit more adorable, if I do say so myself. Um, next slide. So one of our best practices is collecting detailed data in, in order to inform our efforts. In addition to the Viking Vault Food Pantry, we also, prior to COVID, held free hot cooked breakfasts on both of our campuses as well as the love markets where we provided a frozen chicken and all the sides for an entire meal along with a recipe. These events occurred twice a month and allowed us to not only feed hungry students on a regular basis, but also to get the word out about accessing the Viking Vault. We found that our student assistants uh, who worked these events really helped to destigmatize its use quite organically. Additionally, we would also make sure to have our CalFresh student specialists on site at each event to assist students with applications. In response to the pandemic, we, like everyone across the country, experienced a huge influx of individuals in need. We began drive through socially distanced grab-and-go food distributions, and as you can see, our Viking Vault numbers for February through March were nearly that of our entire fall 2019 semester. Although our numbers of students served dipped recently, we, are, we recently experienced our biggest, uh, largest turnout to date, just this last Tuesday. We attribute this uptick to better marketing as well as the fact that students face continued pandemic ramifications. Unemployment benefits are running out while pandemic relief funds have been halted and our students are struggling with high rents in the city of Long Beach, as well as increased costs of living. Financial aid, as we all know, has not kept up with the higher cost of education. However, we're not now delving into a whole nother webinar, so we're not going to go there right now. Next slide. Community relations. Our community partners have been instrumental in helping LBCC meet the moment as well as the needs of our students. A barrier that we were able to overcome was that our Long Beach City College Foundation agreed to amend their Articles of Incorporation, which were written in the 1970s and enabled Long Beach City College to access, I'm sorry, to access food programs such as the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank. This was a major victory as many of our sister community colleges had faced the same issue and it took a like-minded, foundation executive director to recognize that student needs have changed over the last 50 years and that socioeconomic challenges such as food and housing insecurity contribute to poor collegiate completion and retention rates, an issue that was previously not regarded when the articles were originally written. Faith-based organizations are a tremendous support to LBCC. Grateful Hearts provides us with weekly fresh produce. The National Council of Jewish Women routinely donate to our pantry and in observance of Hunger Awareness Month, Temple Israel held a food donation event in our name and collected over 3,000 pounds of food. Most recently, the Long Beach International Rotary Club adjusted their annual Feeding the Future event in order to conduct a safe and socially distanced food collection on our campus, which yielded over 6,000 pounds of groceries. As we work to keep our Viking Vault stocked, partnerships such as these are an incredible supplement in addition to the mainstays we purchased with our hunger-free hunger allotment funds. As the saying goes, it really take, does take a village, and we are so very fortunate to have a rich vein of community support for our students. And I also want to highlight, it's not on this slide, but community relations, you know, I wanna highlight the on-campus community support network as we've relied on support from Equity, which I provided uh, and lead the, our Chromebook and hotspot distribution and they've also provided funding for grocery cards to distribute. Our cashier's office, who's mailed out over 650 bus passes, and our student affairs team, whose staff consistently volunteers to help pack and distribute uh, for our grab-and-go events. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a couple of pictures of the amount of food that we were receiving. This is from our Temple Israel. Uh, food drive. Again, it was three days. We picked up the food each day, brought it back, and uh, they really filled our pantry. Next slide. And these are some images from the most recent event that Dianka was talking about from the Long Beach Rotary Group. Um, so, you know, they had their volunteers outside uh, to make sure, again, we were enforcing social distance requirements. And um, in terms of the format, it was basically like a grab and go, only instead of students driving up to receive their food, it was donors driving up and staying in their car um, as the Rotarians were picking up the food. Next slide. 
So earlier, uh, the, they were talking about the HIP program or the Homeless and Housing Insecure Pilot Program, which we are a recipient of. And through that partnership and funding, we are working with Hovenis Inc. And they are centrally located in Los Angeles. They're a housing agency and they have partnerships and actually serve various community college and uh, a four-year campus also throughout LA County. And Hovenis is providing direct housing placement for up to 40 students over the annual three-year period of the HIP program. And for students to be eligible for this program, they have to identify as experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity. They need to be registered and currently into nine units. Um, they have to have a minimum of nine units completed and in good standing with the college, including a 2.0 GPA. I do want to highlight that this is a housing first organization, though. So if a student has eight units, six units, and maybe they have DSPS qualifications, we're going to meet the student where they're at and make sure we're addressing their needs, um, putting their needs first over a unit or two of um, what's on paper. And then these, this, the way that they provide their housing services are through these two options, college focused bridge housing, which provides no cost, temporary safe housing that allows our students to become stable while they work with case managers to obtain their own lease agreements or connect with other permanent housing options within the Hovenis continuum of care. And the college focused rapid rehousing program, which provides flexible rental subsidies and supportive services like housing navigation to assist individuals experiencing homelessness and return to permanent housing. Um, and of course, this is college focused program. So this is with the ultimate goal of making sure they're meeting their own educational and career goals. And I also wanna highlight, you know, their population, their, their primary population they serve is typically 18 to 25, but throughout the um, collaboration of developing our MOU, we made sure that there are no age requirements because we do have a high population of older non-traditional students who are experiencing homelessness, as well as students with dependents. Um, so everybody's really eligible for the program. Um, next slide. So outreach is of course important to discuss and talking about basic needs services. We, the majority of our students that we are making contact with specifically for housing services is through our emergency aid application. This semester so far, we've received over 1,400 housing requests from students that are self-identifying that they are literally homeless or at risk of homelessness, which is more than Dianca and myself can reach and connect with in a single semester to provide appropriate and holistic services. So what we did was work with our IT team to build a responsive emergency aid application. So if the students select on the emergency aid application that they're experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness, then there are specific questions the application follows up with to ask them to provide more details about their living situation, which helps us prioritize the students with the highest need first. So it asks them, are they sleeping in a car? Are they couch surfing? Are they borrowing a room? Are they in a shelter using a hotel voucher? Things of that sort. Um, and when, the when we actually first released the application um, in March, it was, those questions weren't built into the application. It was, um, once students submitted the application, they were sent a follow-up supplemental questionnaire. But we were seeing that this, we were losing students that weren't submitting that extra form. So it was great and helpful to work with IT and they were able to adjust the emergency aid application so they didn't have that extra step. Um, but the students do still receive a follow-up email, but that's with instructions to change their dependency status and to let us know of their um, homeless status. So it provides them the document as well as the Dropbox that's connected to financial aid for students to submit those documents for verification. Um, beyond the emergency aid application, we did create a basic needs canvas page, which all of our students are familiar with. And this helps us to update services you know, throughout COVID-19, there was various cities throughout LA County that provided rent relief programs. So we were keeping it up to date with the deadlines and sending those informations out so students were aware of the rental relief programs, as well as additional um, holistic services of mental health services, career services, wellness, and then of course, promoting our, our grab and go events. Uh, we work through academic affairs and student affairs and student services to promote our basic needs program. 
So we sent to academic affairs and all of our associate and adjunct faculty that our syllabus statement to include. And we sent a couple of PowerPoint slides and encouraged the faculty and let them know the importance of taking a couple of minutes and, and opening that space up in the classroom to let them know of the resources that are available and also encouraging the students to reach out to the faculty if they need to support. And we know this has been effective because if we've had a handful of students let us know, hey, my professor let me know that I can contact you for housing support. You know, um, I'm not sure how to go about it or whatnot. But so it, that's been um, great that we have supportive faculty that are continuing to send referrals to. We've had uh, presentations to our equity program, such as Emoja Justice Scholars, which is our program that serves formerly incarcerated and system impacted students. And of course, Guardian Scholars, the next step, which serves our foster youth population on campus. And also shout out to our ASB because they initiated their own basic needs committee and they'll be helping us throughout the year to, to destigmatize and help promote our services. And Dianca mentioned earlier, this, was, uh, this past week was our biggest uh, I had our highest attendance at our grab and go. We had 363 cars and we served a total of uh, over 1400 total people in the household. And we attribute this to our Viking engagement system, which actually has, as you see, 73,000 total enrolled. And this is, it's the number so high because it actually includes some alumni folks, um, as well as every currently enrolled student. And then we do have social media, which is the LBCC Healthy Vikings. And this Healthy Vikings is not only for basic needs. The Healthy Viking initiative was through our student health services and they actually provide, you know, they have the nursing, so the physical health, as well as mental health support services. And then we include our basic needs in there as well too. Um, and really quick, we did have a, a conversation about having our own basic needs Instagram, but in terms and considering the stigma along with basic needs, we thought it would be best to continue building on what the Healthy Viking Initiative has already initiated too, and they already have over a thousand followers. And oh, one more aspect too that's not on here that we're building is the federal work study program. So we're currently hiring some students. We'll be providing them like a list of name and numbers basically, so they can continue to reach out students, um, you know, online or phone to just make that connection that uh, Melissa was talking about earlier and have that peer support available to help bring awareness to our services again. Next slide. So uh, getting into the last couple of points of best practices, uh, we are all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has been a foundational framework to highlight the importance of basic needs for our students to succeed. However, as Melissa and our colleagues at IVC has highlighted that effective and holistic approaches go beyond providing a bag of groceries or even a place to stay. Sometimes hierarchical ways of thinking can be restrictive to understanding the complexities of our students' needs and experiences. For example, if we're not considerate of our students' self-esteem and, and, and it, you know, that the, the belongingness and love needs, then it could prevent us from increasing access to our basic needs services if we're not aware of that stigma of food pantries. So I want to offer the indigenous medicine wheel that we often refer to as we present throughout LBCC as a holistic framework to supporting our students' needs and understanding that our students' physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental well-being are all happening simultaneously and they overlap with each other. Because to give a student a place to sleep and say they're good to go is not a trauma-informed approach. So taking the next steps to connect them with mental health resources, career services, or even tutoring or online resources will better support our students as a whole human being. So even if we can't provide these services directly through our basic needs centers, it's important to expand our network of services beyond food and housing to support our students as best as possible, including, including like I said, the tutoring, counseling, career services, mental health, transfer, uh, counseling, and domestic violence. Because as our students are, are crying and they're distressed with us on the line, we want to acknowledge their emotions and their spirit are also important to support. And we want to treat our basic needs program with a holistic approach to case management and not just food and housing services for our students to access. Next slide. So for the sake of time, I won't go over all of the numbers, but I do want to highlight uh, that we do not 
di directly determine providing our services based on race or gender. There's not a question in our emergency application that asks for race or gender, um, but by prioritizing high need populations, we're able to ensure that the resources are accessible for our students who are historically marginalized or disproportionately impacted. And having these numbers available is also important to validate an equitable approach to our outreach efforts. As we can see, the high percentage of our students who are uh, literally homeless, as you know, we have 52% of our literally homeless students that are identified as Black and African American, and we only have 14% of our students on campus that identify as Black and African American. Um, so we we're seeing the the high need to again make sure that we're outreaching to the students that often have the highest need. Um, next slide. So just hitting home uh, these three points to highlight how, how we make equity real for our basic needs program is prioritizing grocery card distribution by high needs populations. So as we receive these thousands of requests, it's um, prioritizing based off of if they identify as literally homeless, or foster youth or AB 540, DREAMer and DACA students who aren't able to benefit from CARES Act funding, um, Justice Scholars, TRIO, Emoja Puente, et cetera. Building in these emergency application uh, questions to help identify those levels of student need, also including if they have a reliable source of income uh, in addition to their level of, or their current living situation and focusing our outreach efforts to our equity programs um, as I mentioned, our foster youth programs, justice scholars, uh, to make sure that we're putting intentional efforts to help them be aware of what we have available. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much to our campuses for sharing all of those amazing best practices. Um, I find it so inspiring how much they do on a shoestring budget with limited staff in the middle of a pandemic. And I hope that they um, have inspired you and your basic needs centers to carry forward um, such creativity and responsiveness um, seemingly overnight to really address student needs, which really leads to um, the policy recommendations that I want to leave us all with um, as we conclude this webinar. So just from hearing from the colleges themselves, I think it's really important to note that there needs to be a permanent state funding source for student basic needs centers. Uh, we cannot underscore this enough, and this is going to be one of um, our priority areas that we want to focus on in the future. Um, basic needs have never been more important, and we really need to protect the centers and also encourage their expansion as the demand is probably only going to increase as, as time goes on. Other recommendations um, that we want to leave you with are uh, we want to further develop campus strategies to address college student homelessness, uh, continue to build that capacity, that knowledge, and those best practices. We want to expand, uh, expand programs like Fresh Success that Colleen had mentioned prior. And finally, always invest in data collection and evaluation. Um, as the campuses um, that joined us today show, data tells an amazing story, the qualitative, the quantitative, all of it, um, and it is really necessary ingredient to continue the momentum of this work. So that is it for the webinar today. Um, I think we have maybe two minutes <laughs> for a Q&A. Um, if anybody has any questions, as I mentioned prior, um, you can leave your questions in the uh, panel. So thanks everyone. Um, I've been responding to the questions that have come in uh, directly because I know we're pretty much at the end of time. So I'm not seeing uh, anything else coming in that I didn't already get a chance to respond to. So I think uh, we're good. And Melissa, you can just go ahead and wrap it up. Perfect. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. And if anybody has any follow-up that they would like to touch base about, my email is at the bottom of the slide right here. Um, I would be happy to further this conversation. Um, and we really thank you for your time and attention to this really important area. It's so timely to what we're all experiencing during COVID-19. And I can't wait to see a year from now the progress that is 
improved upon from all of these lessons learned and best practices um, stemming from this difficult time. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thank you to our presenters for providing such a wealth of information. Take care, everybody. Thanks again.